Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started here. My name is Jill McDonnell, and I will serve as your host for today for GGNA's webinar, Preparing for the Tight Budget Year, Building an Advancement Development Services Business Plan. Today, we'll review the functional areas of advancement and development services and detail the necessary steps for a successful business plan, as well as examine the operations assessment advancement services should undergo and common supportive measures they should take to advance fundraising goals. Feel free to ask questions throughout the session using the question icon, which you can find right here, and we'll address them all at the conclusion of the presentation. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to our presenter today, GGNA Senior Vice President, Debbie Anglin. Hi everyone, welcome um, to today's webinar. I, uh, the reason or the thought behind this came from a session that I did at a conference with my colleague Mary Carol Stark where we discussed uh, advancement services operations and continued to emphasize the need for the advancement services and development services organization to have a business plan. You may call it a strategic plan, an operation plan, but basically, a plan that outlines what your goals and objectives are for the year and, and how you go about um, creating and defining those goals. After the session, several people came up to us and said, we've never done this. And I was a little shocked because some of them I viewed as senior advancement services professionals. And they said, we've never done this. How do we get started? And so for quite a while, Mary Carol and I have been talking about doing a session specifically about advancement service business plans. With the current economic climate that we're in right now, I think most of us are facing, and most of you are facing, tight budget years where you're being asked to truly look at your operation and determine not if you're going to cut where you're cut, but where and when you'll be cutting operation expenses. So we thought this might be a good opportunity for us to revisit the need to put together a formal business plan for your operations. Although throughout the presentation I'm going to be referring to things as advancement services or development services, um, which is generally a term that is identified with large university operations, I want you to understand that the principles we'll be discussing apply to every type of support services operation that is providing support for a fundraising or advancement program. So, oops, sorry, I'm getting used to my WebEx. Um, so today, what we'll be covering is to discuss the situation and again the purpose behind having a business plan. We're going to talk about how you're going to go about building the business plan and the need to make sure that you are incorporating and integrating in your plan goals that will support the fundraising objectives. Because the financial situation is, is so important at this time to take into consideration during your planning, we're also going to be discussing the need or prior to doing any planning, doing a formal operations assessment of your organization to see where you can find opportunities to reduce costs both programmatically and perhaps even through some staff adjustments. Then we're going to go through the business process or the process of actually developing your plan and incorporating them into the fundraising goals. At the end, I'm going to try to do sort of a little case scenario um, of how you might do that, and then I'll try to leave 15 minutes for questions and answers. So let's look at the current situation. Right now, everyone is hearing about budget cuts. Um, if you're a state-funded organization, it can be quite severe, but I want to look at, as well, some of the largest organizations who've had huge endowments, who almost never had to suffer through the recessionary period some of the state-funded organizations have, are now looking at the need to cut quite a bit of their budget. Um, the first budget 
or, or bullet in this slide talks about Stanford where specifically they're saying the Office of Development needs to cut 20% of their staff. And in fact, they have been cutting staff and programs. Um, Harvard, an organization that everyone has looked at and said, you know, is amazing and has the largest endowment, is also looking to cut staff and budget, and particularly in the fundraising operation. In years past, what we've seen is that the development programs or advancement programs have not had to take as much of a hit as other operations within an organization when a budget year is tight because they are revenue generating operations. That's no longer the case. Even though we understand that they are generating revenue for the operation, they still have to take a cut. And when the CFO is looking at all of the budget line items, they're going to look at the development and advancement services area and see it as a profit center, not a revenue generator. So now we're looking at why should you build a business plan, knowing what we've just discussed. The first reason that I always say to my clients is if you don't set the priorities for your organization, others will. And here, of course, taking from Gilbert, we see the pointy-haired boss coming to Gilbert and telling him his project funding is being cut in half, but, but the objectives are still the same. Um, I have been in an organization where that has happened, where someone has come and just slashed my budget without really understanding my operation. So this is an opportunity for you to take control of that process and not let other people who don't fully understand what your group does um, make the decisions regarding where you're going to cut. Sorry, I'm trying to advance to the next slide and it's not going. There we go. Um, the other reason why you should take control of this process is often the director of advancement services and in fact your staff are in the best position to observe and initiate the valuable change needed. Um, again, I'm drawing on Gilbert and I swear this is the last time you're going to see that, a cartoon. But in this case, Gilbert is out walking around the office and comes across a gentleman who is watering plastic plants. The company has made the decision to replace the plants that were real with plastic so they can save money, but they failed to look at the fact that they still had a contract with a firm to come in and service the plant. The point I'm making here is that Gilbert, if you were the director of advancement services, you have insight to almost every programmatic area within the advancement operation because they come to you for services. You know when the annual fund is going to do a mailing, when the alumni association is going to do a mailing, when the goals for major gifts have shifted because they are coming to the prospect management or research area and looking for a new projects or new prospects for those initiatives. You are the core, the center hub, if you will, for that operation and often you know what is going on much more than some of the executive leadership might. So you are in a, a position to actually look at all of the things that are happening within the development and advancement operation and start to have that kind of keen eye on how can we make some changes to become more efficient. The purpose of your plan, of course, is to guide your own management functions so that you can establish performance measurements for your staff and for your organization and to articulate a vision to the greater operation and translate that into achievable objectives. You're saying, what does that mean? <laughs> so we'll get into sort of how we're going to build a business plan or the components of the business plan. When I look or think about the advancement services business plan, I realize that it has to be more than just a catalog of the work that you do. I don't want to see our organization will process all gifts and receive them. Our organization produces lists and labels. Our organization produces uh, prospect profile reports. That's the work that you do. That is important work and in some part of the plan you're going to explain 
what each of the functional components of advancement or development services does. But for your goals and objectives, it has to be much more than that. It has to integrate the goals of the annual giving program, the major gift program, and the plan giving program. And how your organization is going to contribute to the successful achievement of their goals. This means that you, the director, must actively seek out that information. Oftentimes, you are not at the table. Maybe you are not even invited to the, excuse me, planning retreat that the other um, executives in your organization are going to. So you're not privy to the information or the discussions they're having, which is unfortunate, and you need to try very hard to get yourself into those types of um, meetings. But if you are not, that doesn't leave you off the hook for finding out that information in order to build your plan. You need to go ahead and start setting up meetings with each of the program directors for the annual giving program, major gift programs. There may be multiple. You may have a central major gift office, and you may need to actually go out and meet with each of the individual schools or units um, within your operation if you have a decentralized fundraising program and ask them what are their objectives. If you can get a hang, um, if you can get a copy of their program plan, do so. Chances are they're still developing them, but this is still the time for you to have those conversations. There we go. Um, it's important as you draft your plan to explain what the added value is if you implement your goals and objectives. So just saying that you're going to implement barcoding is not really going to attract anyone's attention or get them to support that endeavor. You've got to be able to add the value. If I implement barcoding to annual fund remit, we will be able to receipt and acknowledge our donors in a shorter amount of time. This leads to better stewardship. If we implement a web-based system, it means our development officers will have remote access to the systems and reports, which may increase their ability to submit contact reports and ultimately move some of their prospects. It's important to take what you're doing and, and articulate it in a way that the fundraisers and your executive leadership can see value in it. Often I will find a plan that will start talking about technical um, projects, and people listen and they say, it sounds really good, but they don't know what that means for them. It's important that you do this. Also within your plan, you need to discuss obstacles which might negatively impact the outcome. So if you have staff turnover in certain areas, that might slow or impede the process. If you require some budgetary resources for this, one-time funding, and you're not able to secure that, that will, of course, impact your ability to meet those goals. And then the other part of this is, of course, dependency on the completion of other projects. If you are working with central IT and you need to do a system upgrade, you may have to be dependent on their schedule and their ability to complete certain technical aspects of that project before you can fully implement that upgrade. And of course, the big thing that will impact your ability to meet your objectives is if there's a change in the fundraising priorities or the advancement priorities. Um, for me personally, one year at an institution that I worked at, we had the wonderful um, honor of having two Nobel Prize winners in the same year. This was unprecedented for our organization and in fact, obviously, for many of yours. And the president of our organization became very excited and wanted to share this news with the entire constituency of the university, something he's never done before, which is send a letter under his name. We as advancement people wanted to take advantage of that and also include in this um, a form that allowed them to update their information and send it back to us and also a link to a website where they could directly update their information. But that meant that we now had some projects on our plate that we had not anticipated. So changes in, in priorities can happen quickly, and we have to deal with them. But we also must make sure that we articulate that in our plan. And when those changes happen, 
that we go back to our plan and we revise it. So at the end of the year, if we haven't met all of our objectives, we can look back and understand why. Within your plan, you have to articulate again how you will evaluate success. Um, what performance measures are you going to look at? How are you going to measure staff performance? And one of the best ways in which to do this, and, and I would suggest that you do this on a quarterly basis at least, looking at your plan, seeing where you are, but one of the best ways that I found is actually going back to the program directors whose goals I have taken and said I'm going to try to support and ask them and survey them to see, am I meeting your needs? Have your needs changed? Um, it's important to constantly evaluate your plan and gauge how you're doing so that there are no surprises at the end of the year. And now we're going back into sort of the communication of the plan. The plan is no good if, it, if you write it and then it sits and nobody knows what you're working on. Um, you have two audiences to communicate with, your own internal advancement services staff and the leadership of your operations, of your organization, the director of development, directors of marketing, communications, et cetera. And there are two different messages that you're going to have to craft as you're working with each of these two different audiences. Um, when you're doing this, I suggest that you have a wide distribution of your plan to the advancement leadership. Send a draft to the leadership and to your staff for comments. It may not be finalized yet, but what better time to get their buy-in to what your plans are for the year? Identify what your employees' roles are going to be so that they understand what, they're, uh, what they are responsible for in the implementation of that plan and how they're going to be evaluated. They also then become engaged with this and have some ownership. The one thing I don't like is for everyone to spend a lot of time developing these plans, having these retreats, drafting the plans, and then saying, phew, thank goodness that's over with. We can go back to our real work now, and the plan sits on the shelf. So it's important that you communicate that plan List the top ten priorities or the top five priorities in a very public place. One of my clients does this by posting a large whiteboard with the top priorities for the year, the timelines, the person responsible for executing that priority, and where they are. That is very, very helpful to them. When people come in and they have something that they feel is an immediate priority, they can see what the staff is already working on and it's helped diffuse some situations. And then, of course, the other component of communicating is, again, regular progress reports. Just draft a one-page format that you send out quarterly to all of the directors within your operation, explaining where you are, what you've done, and if there have been problems along the way, be honest about those as well. And of course, one of the very most important pieces, which I already touched on, is execute the plan. Don't let it sit on a shelf. Um, schedule regular meetings to keep it on track. Often people will try to incorporate everything into one big staff meeting every week or every month, and that is so ineffectual, I cannot tell you. Um, what you need to do is have two different types of meetings. Your regular operations meetings, which you talk about and meet with your directors on a weekly basis, and you discuss short-term strategies, how you're putting out the fires that have crept up last week or this week. What are they working on today? You probably already are having these meetings. What I don't want you to do is incorporate into these, okay, now let's talk about our, our business plan for the year and our goals and where are we. That should be a separate meeting. It should have a separate group. It's not a full staff meeting. It's really with the people who are, have been noted within your plan as being responsible for implementing those goals and sitting down with them on a monthly basis to discuss where we are, what are the issues that we may be facing, how can we resolve them, where do you as the director need to step in, who else do you need to bring to the table, and then moving forward. So 
when I discuss this, I always say that you should have a mission statement within your plan. And it can be very simple. This is one I actually did pull off of a university website. I'm not going to tell you who. <laughs> but it was very simple and, and to the point. Um, then you need to start stating your goals. In this case, they're saying for this year, we're understanding that there is um, the need to reduce costs but still provide the high levels of service that our fundraising effort needs. So this, the plan should start with a mission statement. And here's basically your format. A mission or vision statement, which I hope you'll revisit every year. You don't have to change it every year, but if it's the same one that you've had for the last 10 years, chances are it's not as relevant as it should be. And you need to really rethink what it is that you're doing, because I would expect that you are doing things differently and that, in fact, the way in which you're operating has changed. Then you want to list your goals, any major systems or process improvements that the advancement operation is planning for this year. Then describe the planned objectives and the support operations goals that you're going to implement for that. This should also integrate in the goals for the annual giving program, major gift, and plan gift. There are some operational goals that may be different, but in general, everything should be to support those fundraising efforts. And then you're going to list the challenges or assumptions that you have for success, adequate budget, staff turnover that we've already discussed. This is just a sample template that I've put together. And you, it's hard to read probably for you. But basically, it's a spreadsheet that, talks, that goes into what's the program, what are your priorities for this, the beginning of this, um, it is that the Advancement Services Office is needing to reduce their budget by 8%. And then it starts going into the goals and the tactics that your plan is to do that, how you're going to measure it, what's the timeline, and who is responsible for this goal. And there needs to be a name there. It has to have someone who's going to take ownership of it. And then we go down into, for the annual giving, we start to state what their goals are, which may be to increase unrestricted support by 10%. And then the ways in which they plan to do this, how you're going to support the goal, and we go through again. How are we going to measure it? Who's responsible? What additional resources do we need? And what are the costs associated with that project? As I discussed earlier, the first thing, even though we just went through how to build a business plan, the first thing I think you should do, especially now, in order to find opportunities where you can reduce costs, is to assess your own operation. Understand who's doing what and how. The areas that you're probably going to be looking at are your records management, um, processes, donation processes, prospect management, perhaps stewardship, certainly reporting and analysis of your data. And when you do your assessment, each process that you're looking at, you should look at what are the standards for my staff? What are the performance standards? For each task they're doing, why are they doing it? And most importantly, who's benefiting from this task? Um, actually, I'm going to go back to that slide because one of the examples I have as I'm going into organizations and doing audits of their operations, one, one area that I always find is that they're making excessive amounts of copies of gift documentation and checks. And it's because they've always done that. And I always I, that's why I hear, why do you do that? I don't know. We just always have. Does that sound familiar? Um, usually that's because 20 years ago or 25 years ago, there was a need to make copies to distribute information. But now people have access at their desktops to donor information, to gift reports. They can look at scanned documentation. Um, so we revisit this need for making copies. Why are you doing it? Who's benefiting from it? And then come back with, is there a cost savings if we don't do that? Who will miss it? And those are the questions you need to ask yourself as you're going through the process of 
evaluating your operations. So you're going to be looking again for reduced costs, relevancy of the policies and procedures. Most organizations have not taken a step back and relived or relooked at their policies and procedures that they developed 10 to 15 years ago, most often um, tightly correlated to their system conversions. So I would say go back and look at them and ask yourself again, who's benefiting from this policy or procedure and is it still relevant? Are there ways we can change things to make our processes more efficient? Um, look at your manual processes and see if there are ways you can automate them. Is there a way for you to, instead of downloading a list of credit card transactions into a hard copy report, Instead, import that into a file you can upload into a batch and review and accept the transaction. Um, I was at an organization where they were getting NCOA updates and they were not automatically loading them in. They were looking at each one and they were looking at hard copy or they were looking at hard copy updates from their calling center as opposed to receiving that in a an electronic file or a delimited file that could be loaded into your batches. There's a lot of efficiency gain when you start to look at all of the pieces of paper that are coming across people's desks with information that could be loaded electronically. The other area that you should look at very clear um, in depth is your reports, report requests, extract files. Understand why people are asking for them. Look at your process and your reporting strategy, which may have been just amazing when you implemented it 10 years ago, but we have new tools now available to us. Is there a better, more efficient way to do this? And of course, as you're going through this checklist and you're looking at each of your processes, go back to your customer satisfaction. Talk to people. Find out how your organization is perceived and if you're really supporting their needs. So as we talk through some of this, this slide kind of talks about the same type of information that I just went over, um, staff performance expectations, et cetera. But the next one um, is an interesting slide because I would like you to understand what it costs for each of these processes, for each of these operations that you're assessing. It's a key part of your analysis. So when we look at gift and pledge processing, for example, what we're looking at here are three different operations. Each one of them processes 100,000 transactions a year. In the first column, that organization has 17 gift processors. And if I think about it, when I look and do the calculations, that means that each one can process or is processing 6,000 transactions a year. And that might sound like a lot, but when I look at how many they, that means per day, it's 23. So my question would be, what is the staff doing for the remainder of their day? Because 23 transactions is not a full eight-hour day by any means. So I'm looking at staff performance standards here. And now I'm looking at cost. If their salaries were $25,000 each per year, that translates to a cost per transaction of $4.25. That's a very expensive transaction to process. If I go into the organization that has eight, they're processing 12,000, which is 46 transactions a day, and their cost is down to $2. And if I look at an organization that has four who can process 24,000 transactions manually a day, now their workload is up to 92. Um, in our analysis and from benchmarking many organizations across the, the country, what Greg Scott Blair has found is the third organization is running at a best practice standard for manual processing of transactions. People should be able to do 24,000 a year, which is less than 100 a day. So think about that when you're evaluating your staff. Of course, you need to take into consideration. 
must be I think Al pushed something last night. Um, it, one organization I spoke with here had um, the ability, one, one SIF processor was able to process 92,000 a year because they were so automated. That's something that we would all love to strive for, but at least get to the 24,000 and a dollar per transaction. We'd love to see it go under that if possible. The next slide looks at another very extensive part of your operation, and that is reporting and programming costs. We figured it takes approximately your average amount of three days to process a report request. Um, it could take up to 10 days. So then we look at the cost of programmers at the hourly rate. Depending on where you are, this is going to vary, but the cost for a a report will range somewhere between $1,000 a report on up to 5000 or more. This is a cost that's quite extreme and you need to be very cautious about that. If you're able to, to articulate this to the leadership, one would think that you might be able to discuss how to get a handle on your ad hoc reporting requests, perhaps get their buy-in in ways in which you can prioritize those requests. And more importantly, it may allow you to get some funding to purchase software that you probably wanted to build out your data warehouse and implement some of the tools that are now available for users to pull their own. That could reduce the amount of reports that you need and perhaps you wouldn't need as many highly paid programmers or you could finally put them to work on projects that truly did improve your systems and processes. I would suggest each of you take both of the, or all of you take those charts and start plugging in your own numbers and see where you fall. The one area that no one really wants to talk about when you're having to assess your operation, and in fact, when we're looking at very severe budget cuts, is staffing. Um, it unfortunately is something that you're going to have to address. Many of you are going to have to reduce your staff because salary is one of the largest budget line items that you're going to see in your overall operation. Um, often you'll be able to reduce time, so some people may want to go part-time um, and, and do a reduction in their schedule. The UC system, which has been in the University of California, has been in the papers where I live, out in California quite a bit, is voting on a mandatory staff furlough based on their salary range of how many days they will be um, furloughed each day. I'm going to switch because I understand that there is some noise coming from my phone. Just a second. Yes, yeah, you just have to speak up. Okay, hang on. This should be a little bit better, I hope. <laughs> That's what I get for trying to use my headset. Um, hopefully this wasn't too terrible. Um, but you are going to need to look at how you're going to redeploy your staff. Um, certainly many organizations are going through a hiring freeze at this time as well. So if you have a vacancy, chances are you're not going to be able to fill it. So going back through your operations and deciding how you're going to address that void is, is very important. And as you evaluate your staff and come up with some performance standards, that may help you. The other area that I think that we need to look at very closely is evaluating your software that you're using. Um, I've gone into client operations where they have the Alumni Relations Office using a vendor for the Alumni Directory and online community, and the Development Office using a separate vendor for their online giving website. 
um, and development officers who've on their own gone ahead and purchased or gotten some freeware to help them manage their prospects so that they're looking at that as their customer relations management software. Um, when you evaluate each one of these and look at actually the functionality they provide, you may be able to see ways in which you can consolidate. So the software that does uh, provide for the alumni community an online directory may also have an online giving tool that you can use, and then you can reduce the amount of software that you're supporting and reduce costs. If software is coming up for renewal, you may have an opportunity to renegotiate the terms. Um, the best way to go about doing this is to diagram all of your data sources and, and look at what the requirements are, which again goes back to meeting with people who are using this. But we did find in this one particular um, operation the ability to consolidate some of the software they were using and reduce the cost significantly not to mention the fact that we didn't need to have as much um, help desk support in trying to support those applications. So now we're going to go into just some of the, a little bit of a case scenario, if you will, um, on applying what we've been talking about. We're going to pretend that we are Grenzbach Glare University, or GGAU and I am the Director of Advancement Services. What I have just found out from the annual fund is that they need to raise 20% more in unrestricted money to offset and, and augment some of the budget dollars that are needed for operations. To do this, the Director has told me that he's going to increase the number of annual fund callers that will be phoning from the telemarketing system the plan is that they're going to increase the actual credit card donations they receive from the telemarketing system. And they're going to do something they've not done before but talked about it for years. They're going to start a parents fund program. Understanding all of this, the first thing I think about as a director of advancement services is I've got to look at our data and I have to make sure the phone and the addresses are clean, that we have enough for all of these callers. And how am I going to do this? Of course, I'm going to start looking at different vendors. I'm going to start negotiating contracts to send our information, our data out, and get new phone and address attends. Um, then I'm going to go look at the telemarketing system. I'm, I'm going to realize I need to also include in my plan an upgrade of that system to the latest version so I can add more calling stations to it and make that more efficient. So in order to support the parent program goal, as an advancement services director, this also means that I'm going to have to implement an electronic feed of the parent data from the student system into my fundraising system. I'm going to need to take that data and, again, run it through that vendor for address and phone appends. And I'm going to create a web page, a parents fund web page, with lots of good information for my parents to know about with an online giving, giving link. To increase or to support their goal for increasing credit card gifts, I'm going to have to conduct a workflow analysis and re-engineer that gift processing process to support the increase in these transactions. That may mean implementation of an online giving card transaction process, and it certainly means creating a process to upload that credit card information into a batch in my fundraising database. These are all projects and objectives I'm going to incorporate into my plan, which is going to draw or, or tie back to the annual fund giving fundraising objectives for the year. And I'm going to make sure that I put that in my plan. For the major gift program, I've met with the director of major gifts, and they have been told that they need to raise $10 million for endowed fellowships this year. This is a, a campus priority. Um, they also have been told that they need to increase the Million Dollar Society for lifetime giving donors, which was right now at 500 and they need to go up to 650 And where they were currently raising around $65 million a year, the trustees, and we know how trustees can be, have said, we think you should be at $100 million a year running rate. So that's your goal this year, to reach $100 million. 
Now, you know, major gift, people are going to turn to you and say, how am I going to do this? Where am I going to find the prospect? And this is where advancement services can come in and be extremely helpful. So when I look at this, the first thing, one of the first things I think is, well, they need to know how they're doing against the goal. So I need to create a suite of management reports that, pre that track the progress towards these goals. These are not reports I currently have. So I've got some new reports I have to create, and I want to launch them through a web application, which means that they can have access to these at any time. Um, they don't have to come to me. I also need to identify donors who are close to reaching the lifetime giving level of a million dollars. So I'm going to do some queries of the database and start looking at people who are somewhere between the a lifetime giving level of 500,000 and a million to see how many we have. And from that, I'm going to go directly to prospect research and ask them to look at those people and talk with the development officers who may be assigned to them to discuss whether or not we can come up with a strategy to move them to that new giving level. I'm also, at this point now, data mining is going to come into effect because we need to identify what makes a good fellowship donor. So I need to look at the current donors we have that give to endowed fellowships and come up with the common traits that they have, if possible, which I can then overlay against our database and do some data mining to find people who look like them. I may also, which you know, I didn't put in a bulletin, but I may send my data out and try to get some wealth and capacity information from a third party vendor. So screen some of our prospects to see where have they given before? Does it look like they may be a good fellowship donor? Um, we're going to be, ha we're hopefully, if the major gift program is successful, we're going to have more million dollar plus gifts and more major gifts. So I'm going to assign one of my staff members to handle um, and track those complex gifts. And in essence, they're going to do triage. The gift is going to come to them, and they are going to go out and make sure they connect with the department, with the development officer, whoever they need to get the information. They need to process the gift and coordinate with donor relations and stewardship to make sure that the donor is thanked appropriately and all of the donor relations aspects of that gift are handled well. So, but the first thing is to get it in the system. And to do that, I know that I need to go ahead and work and assign that information or that task to a specific staff member to be responsible. We talked about increased endowed funds for, for fellowships. And I'm going to start creating a process with my finance office to streamline our communication so that I can get the new fund numbers established as quickly as possible. Frequently, the biggest delay that people cite when I come back and say, how come it took so long to process this gift or get it in the system? They'll say, well, it was held up in finance. We didn't get the new fund number. Or they couldn't create the new fund number. And that's what we were waiting for. So I want to be proactive as a director of advancement services here and work with my finance officers to find a way for us to expedite that process to support the major gift fundraising goal. So now we're kind of winding down, and I want to make sure that we have time for questions and answers. But in summary, the first thing you need to do is to conduct an operations assessment to find places you can reduce the cost. Um, I think it's important that you involve each unit within advancement services in building your business plan. I believe that you should hold your director of, of gift processing accountable for looking at the goals of the annual giving and major gift and planned gift programs and create a plan for their operation that incorporates those goals in that you can roll up into the greater advancement services plan. Each plan has to have a timeline and a budget. And very importantly, you must be able to measure the goal. So if your goal is that you're going to um, decrease the amount of time it takes to process a gift, that means you need to know how long it takes today to do it. So you have a baseline to draw from. Make sure that you evaluate your plan on a quarterly basis so that we have no surprises. Communicate your plan. Let others know so they're aware of what you're doing. And most importantly, execute your plan. So now I'm going to turn it over to you to see if you have questions that I might be able to answer. 
If we don't get to your question today, here's my contact information. Please email me. I'd be happy to get back in touch with you and discuss any component of this webinar um, where you may have some questions. And now I'm going to my questions. The first question that popped in is said, do you really mean the gift processing director should create a plan? And yes, absolutely, I do mean the gift processing director should create a plan. And it can be as simple as just putting together that spreadsheet that I showed you. What is it they plan to do? And how is that tied to a goal? So if the annual giving program says they're going to increase their giving by X percentage, or they're going to be doing a direct mail, their goal may be to communicate with the annual giving program and talk about the direct mail piece, make sure that they coordinate with them to have all the appeal codes and information on it, but make sure that they are involved in this planning process. I'm waiting for questions. I can't believe that you're all absorbing everything and have nothing to say to me. Um, oh, hang on. Here comes one. Will we be given a link to this presentation afterwards? Absolutely. Um, Jill will handle the distribution of the presentation later. Yes, uh, tomorrow morning the session will be available, the recording link, as well as the material. And again, if you just click on this question box right at the top of your screen, you're able to type in a question if you have it for Debbie. Are there vendors we use <laughs> that we recommend for um, for cleansing your data. Um, you know, there's several vendors out there on the market, and I've heard mixed reviews of each one of them. Depending on what you're trying to do, what I would do is look at your data first, um, look at how many contactable addresses you believe you have, send those out to an NCOA provider first because they're going to be the least expensive, and then look at the people who you're considering are lost. I also would look at those who have most recently become lost and then choose to go with a vendor such as Alumni Finder that's had a very good return rate but may be a little bit more expensive. So do the masses first that you feel like you may have good information for and you just need confirmation on and then move on to your lost group and see where use the more extensive um, services to try to locate those individuals. Okay, we have another question. Do you see the role of advancement services to look at efficiencies across the department or just within the services team? Wow, that's a great question. I think that you have an opportunity to, to see and, and help build better efficiencies across the department, not just within your own organization. So you can take the assessment process and actually start to go out into some of the other areas. If you sat with the director of annual giving, for example, and actually looked at what was going on within his operation from his administrative assistance point of view, how she's using information and data to the callers and the, um, the fundraisers who may be handling regional annual gifts, chances are you're going to find things that they're doing where you'll say, why are you doing that? We can do this for you. Or we can find a, a quicker way for you to do that. If they're downloading tons of information into spreadsheets and then resorting things, I think that you'll find that you have an answer for that that they didn't even realize there was a question they could ask. Frequently, I will find out people are doing things or they'll say, well, I, I didn't think I could get that. And it's just because they either don't want to bother you or they truly just didn't realize that that data was there in your system and you could pull off of it. I think you have an opportunity to help them become much more efficient. But you have to be very tactful in the way in which you approach them. Oh, 
Okay, well, I'm not seeing any other questions at this okay. point. Okay, so thank you very much, Debbie. I think that concludes today's presentation. Like I said earlier, uh, you will be emailed the session materials and the recording link tomorrow afternoon. And then if you have any further questions, please contact Debbie at theanglin at grenflair.com or you can visit us at grenflair.com. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much.